Thank you for joining us today. My name is Joey White, and I'm the church planning pastor here at Stonewater Church. My brother and I started Stonewater about 15 years ago, and when we started, we had team ministry in mind. Now today, you're gonna see that put into practice because one of our teaching pastors is going to be preaching today. His name is Woody Hager. He has been at Stonewater, him and his wife, for many years and served in many different roles. And you're gonna be challenged by what Pastor Woody has to teach today. So if you're new to Stonewater, I would encourage you to go to our website, stonewaterchurch.com. Click on the connect button, fill out the form, and we're gonna send you a gift just by doing that. And we truly want to begin a relationship with you. At the end of our service today, Pastor Jeremy's gonna come on and tell us our next steps as we prepare to meet together again as a church. Now, our band's about to play their very first song, and this is a song called Breakthrough. God has given our band this song. It's an original song that they put together, and this has been very influential for us to find real breakthrough. So thank you for joining us today and enjoy the service. The darker the cloud, the louder our praise will be. The bigger the storm, the greater your victory. Whatever may come, we know that we are free. For all of our sins you cast into the sea. The darker the cloud, the louder our praise will be. Yeah. The bigger the storm, the greater your victory. Whatever may come, we know that we are free. Oh, for all of our sins you cast into the sea. God, we're ready for you, breakthrough. Come move. Come and do what only you can do. You're great by fear, faith our hearts bow down. Come on, we speak your name. The truth we still shouting out of your praise. Yeah, Jesus, our King, you will have your way. Come on, break through. God, we
Hello, my name is Woody Hager, and I have the honor of being one of the teaching pastors here at Stonewater Church. I've been married to my wife, Jamie, for about 20 years, and I have two beautiful girls that go to Granbury High School. We are in the middle of kind of a new normal. We've been talking about that for the last couple of weeks. And as this week kind of turns into what may be a return to normal, it's clear that the last two months have not been. Um, We've had a really strange time, and I have no doubt that for years to come, we're going to be looking at how we responded these last few months, uh, gosh, for decades, wondering what we could do, what we could have done better. But there is one thing, though, in the span of all of this change uh, that we're all experiencing, but we're not necessarily talking about it. We're talking a lot about what to uncertainty and things like that, but we're not talking about fear, something we're all experiencing. So I wanna do that this morning. I wanna talk about fear. I wanna talk about anxiety and worry. Um, And in particular, uh, probably like you, about a month or two ago or two months ago in the beginning part of March, I I wasn't too anxious. You know, the virus uh, news was making its its, uh, way across the, the world, but you know, the U.S., we were going to weather it, or at least that's what we thought. And as Texans, we think that we can kind of weather anything. And that was where I was. Um, I wasn't too anxious. In fact, I did all the right things. I started working from home. I washed my hands. I kept social distancing. But that all changed. One morning, I woke up and I couldn't breathe. It was about one o'clock. I it felt like some, someone was sitting on my chest or I'd been on the top of a mountain. I just couldn't get my breath. And as I sat there, I thought, I can't be sick. I, can't, I couldn't have caught what everybody's talking about. How could I? But fear, fear was right there and said, that's exactly what it is. And I was too much for me to handle. And I thought, well, no, that can't be it. But two days later, I'm in an ER and I have all the symptoms, high fever, shortness of breath, um, coughing, just all sorts of things going on with me. And as the doctors ran the test and all the protective gear, I was faced with the reality that's exactly what had happened, that I had the virus. And I will never forget the, the doctor coming in and and looking at me, pointing out all the things, all the symptoms, all the tests for a flu and things like that that I had not uh, gotten positive for. And he told me, look, we're gonna, we're gonna test you for the virus, but I'm telling you right now, this is what you have. And for the next 14 days, you need to go home and quarantine yourself from everyone, your family included. The fear there was so heavy not only for my own health, but immediately I raced to, well, if I have it, then what about my family? What about my wife? What about my girls? What about my church family that I'd just seen days before? Fear suddenly just crept into every part of my life. And as I went home and I separated from my family and for 14 days, basically occupied the same 200 square feet in my house, I had a lot of time to think about fear. And I wanna be clear about what the fear was. See, the fear was always about what was gonna happen. It was, today will be the day. Today will be the day that I'm gonna get some sort of news. Somebody's gonna call me. Somebody's gonna post something on social media that they're sick. And I know it's gonna be my fault. Or today's gonna be the day that my wife or one of my girls are gonna come down with the symptoms and then I know it's gonna be my fault. And every morning I woke up with that fear and every night I woke, I thought tomorrow is gonna to be the day for sure. Fear and anxiety about what's gonna happen. But that, that day never came. Every day I got a little bit better. Every day that news didn't come. And there was times that I sat alone going, God, I have, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time alone. No, no hugs from your family, no meals with anyone, just a lot of time to sit and think. So I turned to God and said, God, I'm really anxious. What are you trying to teach me? And from my experience, it it led me to believe that God's not silent on the topic of our fear and what our worries about tomorrow, no matter the uncertainties, that he's not silent on it. 
and we can actually learn something from it. So that's what I wanna do this morning. I wanna walk through what we're all feeling, that anxiety and that fear and that worry about tomorrow and see what God has to say about it, what we can do about it today. Now, before we do that though, because most of us are probably gonna be watching this on, on Facebook on a watch party, I wanna ask some questions and this is for discussion. And I strongly urge you, hey, write something down if God lays it on your heart. You will never know what your kind of comment will do for someone else. So here's a question. We sometimes can't separate fear and the object of our fear or anxiety. They two go together. But this is my question to you. But first, I need you to do, a do me a favor. Forget what you've, what you've listened from the news for the last two months, what you've heard from our leaders, from social media. Push all of that aside. And instead, I want you to think about the people that you know. I mean, the voices that you've heard on the phone or the faces that you've seen face to face. Think about those people. Think about what they must be feeling or they have felt over the last two months. What have been their fears? Because sometimes we can get really worked up on what we think everyone's afraid of, but we don't really know. We don't really see it until we see it in each other. So take a few moments. Here's my final my question. Think about your friends and your family. What are the unspoken fears they might be experiencing right now?
So I'm gonna say something that might sound a bit strange. Fear is not a bad thing. It's what we do when we're afraid or have worry or anxiety that can go bad for us or it can turn really positive for us. And it, it kind of begs the question, why would God make us experience fear? Well, think about this. We live in a very dangerous and broken world, malevolent, evil, and cruel. Just take a look at nature alone, hurricanes, tsunamis, earthquakes, tornadoes, global pandemics. We have, uh, nature is literally trying to kill us. On top of that, you have mankind that throughout history <laughs> has been notoriously evil towards each other. Fear is a way that we are protected. We can see the world around us. We can learn and we can respond and actually find a better way to live in this broken and malevolent world. The problem is, is we get stuck. We get stuck in this fear and we can't move through it. And this generates anxiety and worry about tomorrow. And so God wants us to move through that fear so that we can see the good things on the other side. It produces positive things in our life. But what happens when we can't get unstuck? This is where I think Jesus can actually offer a lot um, of guidance. He talks about worry directly. And in the middle of Matthew, in the, actually in the beginning of Matthew, verses five through seven is a really famous passage called the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount was, um, it's just Jesus talking. And he's just talking about life. And in, if you haven't read your Bible in a while and you're looking for something just to, to ease into, or maybe you don't really consider yourself a Bible reader, Matthew's chapters five through seven is really easy. And I would suggest that you read it because Jesus talks about all sorts of things. He talks about uh, your treasure, uh, hatred, love, prayer, lust, all sorts of things. And he talks about worry. So in chapter six, let's read what Jesus has to say about directly about anxiety and worry and see if we can find a way that we can get unstuck from this fear that keeps us trapped every day. Let's read in chapter, uh, chapter six, starting with verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns and yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you being anxious can add a single hour to the span of his life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. 
So one of the things that we need to remind ourselves whenever we're reading the words of Jesus is to stop. It would be easy for us to just skim over that and say, yeah, Jesus, I know what you're talking about, but it's always a call to dig a little bit deeper. And that's what I'd like to do. So let's, let's go through this verse kind of key point by key point, And it's gonna paint a really good picture about what anxiety is and how ultimately move through it. There's some reminders and some good things in there that Jesus left for our benefit if we're willing to take a look. So here it is. And starting in verse 24, he starts this by saying, you cannot serve both God and money. That word money isn't just about the cash in your pocket or what's in your bank account. It's actually the word wealth. It personifies everything that this world may give you. It's influence and power and possessions. Now, Jesus is saying there's only two options in this world. Either you serve God or you serve this wealth. You don't have any other options. And the reason he says this as he begins to talk about worry is clear. If you serve wealth, you're inviting worry and anxiety right along with it. You will never be free of it. You'll never able to walk through that because it will always bring the fear of losing that wealth into your life. So if you have anxiety, that might be the first thing you do is examine your own heart. Which master am I ultimately serving? The second thing he goes into is in verse 25. He says, do not be anxious about your life, about what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body. This might seem kind of like, why did he pick those things? But think about it. What are the most basic needs for us as human beings? Food, water, clothing, shelter. Jesus is, is naming some of the most basic needs that we as humans need and that we would worry about if we didn't have. But he's asking us not to be anxious about it. So the upshot is, what then should we be anxious for? And it's nothing. If we're not, shouldn't be anxious for our basic needs, then there is nothing we should be anxious for. Let's move on. Verse 26, uh, verse 27, sorry. Which of you being anxious can add a single hour to the span of his life? This is just a gentle reminder. We need to, we don't need to fall into the trap that if if we think about it and we overthink it and we're anxious about it, we think somehow we're helping ourselves. And it's not. We need to remember that worry and anxiety does nothing for us. There's no benefit at all. It doesn't add a single hour to the span of our life. Whatever it may feel, it ultimately doesn't help us. We need to remember that when we're in the middle of it. But look look at verse 26 and 28. This is one of my favorite things that Jesus says. He says, consider the lilies of the field or look to the birds of the air. We think that these are just really kind of beautiful ways of explaining the uh, the, the verse, but it's not. He's actually really intentional about using these things. Let me explain. When's the last time you saw a flower? We're in the middle of Texas. In the spring, flowers are everywhere. They're meant to be a reminder for us that when you see a flower, you stop and you say, am I anxious? Because no matter what I put on my body, no matter how expensive it may be, I will never be dressed like one of these. God, am I anxious? That flower should remind us to examine ourselves. And God, if I am anxious, I need not to be. I gotta turn that over to you. Or look at the birds of the air. Are we working too hard? Are we worrying about the wrong things? If we see a bird, which you will every day, it's still a reminder to us to say, look at my heart, Lord. Am I anxious? Am I worried? These things should remind us about that worry and that we move through it. That if God provides for these, he will provide for us. There's an intentional reason he mentions these two things to remind us to move on. But now we get to the heart of what this whole passage is about. And this is verse 32 and 33. He says, and your heavenly father knows that you need them all. He knows that you need what you need. He was the one that made you. He knows your needs. But what am I gonna do? But this is what he says, but seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness. Now, I'm sure that if we were to just have a talk on what is the kingdom of God and how to seek it, 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 there's, a, there's a lot there, but I will tell you what I think it is in the most basic terms I can. If you wanna seek the kingdom of God, take a look, open your eyes around you. Where is God working? Where are people that are doing things that God would want them to do? Where is their 
Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, self-control. Where is that evident in people's lives? And wherever that is, get connected to it. Get connected and start being a part of that work because it's the best way for God to teach you and guide you to seek his kingdom further. The other part of that says, not only seek his kingdom, but also his righteousness. Well, what does that mean? It means that you're in a right relationship with God and with each other. That if you seek his righteousness to God, is there any sin in my life that I need to clear up? Is there any wrongdoing that I have against a brother or sister? Help me clear up that. That righteousness, that right relationship of God is what he's asking us to do. And and he's asking us to do it first. Hey, when you encounter worry and fear, what's the first thing you should do? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But both of these things come with a promise that if we do these things, and he will, he will add all these things to our number. It's a promise. Seek his kingdom, he'll take care of our needs. And it's just not wishful thinking. This is the best place for people to be able to help you in your time of need. If you're connected and if you have those right relationships, this is wisdom coming right from God's word. Let's look at this last thing he says in verse 34. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. So this is so hard but we need to keep focused on what anxiety and fear does to us today. And this is a word, I think this is the wisdom that he's trying to let us know on. Hey, don't let your anxiety today steal your hope for tomorrow. When I was in that quarantine, those 14 days alone, that's exactly what was happening. I had written the day after and the day after that and the day after that, all of it was already written. I knew what was going to happen. And it stopped me from doing what I could that day. And that's the truth of of anxiety is that it immobilizes us by writing our tomorrow so that we've already given up. Now, looking through that, we have to seek the kingdom of God to move past our fear. But how do you do that? Especially when you're shelter in place and there's not a lot that you can go do. I had these, these same thoughts when I was alone and I was reading this scripture and I thought, God, I'm not going anywhere for another week. How can I seek the kingdom of God? but I realized that wasn't an excuse. There's always something we can do. I picked up my phone and I thought of three guys that I know are going through a hard time. And I thought, I'm gonna call them. I'm gonna love on them. I'm gonna pray with them if I can, just because that's the only way I can seek the kingdom of God where I am locked away. And that's the question I have for you. It's easy to go back and fret about all the things we should have done over the last two months, but let's forget that for a second. What about today? So here's my question. If you were to, instead of your worry and fear of tomorrow, if you were to stop that and instead, what would it look like to seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness today? What would that look like in your life? How would your schedule change? How would your uh, conversations with your spouse or your children go? Who would you call? What would you do? Would you wake up a little early? Would you stay a little late? Think about this for a second. So that's my next question for you. And again, I encourage you, put this in the comments. You never know how your one little idea about how you would serve the kingdom of God and how you would seek it would spur someone else's to make that same sort of action. So starting today, if you were to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, instead of worrying or being anxious, what would you do?
and hear my song of praise will rise to my champion to my rescue glory to the Lord on high there is no one like you and hear my song of praise will rise to my champion to my rescue in glory to the So Jesus teaches us that to move through our anxiety and fear, we have to seek his kingdom and his righteousness. On the other side of that fear, once we move through it, there are some really positive things that are waiting for us. Namely, wisdom, knowledge, safety, vigilance. We're smarter about the world. We know know more about ourselves and about God. And we can navigate this broken and dangerous world a lot better. And if you see this, and you do see this quite a bit, When we're afraid and we do the right things, it actually puts us in a better place. I know probably many of you have lost your job or maybe just in a hard economic time and fear can leave you immobilized just where you are. But if you stay there, things get worse. The idea is to move through it. God, I'm gonna seek your kingdom and your righteousness and I'm gonna move through it. Knowing that that action is the best thing to maybe help us find a new job or make new connections. Or um, think about if you had a family history of disease. You might be fearful that that could, that could take you, but if you were to uh, eat right and to exercise and to go to doctor's visits and things like that, that produces some very positive things, some wisdom about how to avoid that disease and live a longer life. And we see this moving through fear Uh, no matter what role you're in, as a parent with children at home during, with no school, uh, that fear moves us to try new things. But it doesn't matter if you're a parent, uh, a policeman, a soldier, a doctor, a a preacher, it doesn't matter that moving through that fear is where growth is. And if you have stagnated and you just don't feel like God's teaching you or maybe you have stagnated professionally or anything else, look at what you fear. Look at what you're avoiding. It could be that on the other side of that fear is where you're gonna experience that growth, but you again have to move through it. This is ultimately what God sometimes allows the fear into our life is to produce those things that are good for us. And while it's hard and maybe difficult, God is always faithful on the other side. Now, I'm gonna gonna switch gears a little bit because there there is a kind of ironic thing because we're talking about fear, about the fear we experience, but there's a fear that we don't experience that really does us damage. And I think it's worthwhile to take stock and look at that fear. Now, 
this may sound a little strange, but in the first chapter of Proverbs in verse seven, King Solomon makes this statement. He says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And we read the New Testament and it seems like, wait, we should be afraid of God? But that's not exactly what this means. And in fact, this is uh, something that as Christians, we don't really know. What does it mean to fear God? And why is that something we should pay attention to? In fact, you ask 10 different Christians, you're probably gonna get 10 different answers, but most of them would say respect. But the fear of God goes a lot farther than just respect. Let me see if I can, if I can give you some illustrations because this is a fear we need to cultivate. We're ignorant of it, but if we cultivate it, we might actually avoid ourselves a lot of hurt for ourselves and for others. I want you to think about this. Imagine going to the Grand Canyon and stepping right up to the edge with your, just your toes hanging off the edge with thousands of feet below you, would you feel very safe? Absolutely not. You would, you would give that edge a lot of space, but you'd still wanna see the view, but only at a safe, safe dif- distance. Uh, or think about a bonfire, like you go camping with your family, your friends. You have a big roaring bonfire. You get too close to that bonfire, it can be destructive, but the right distance from it You have fellowship, you could cook your food, there's light, there's warmth. It's a good thing, but it's also dangerous. It needs distance, a safe distance. Or I want you to think about this is that, let's say you go to Africa on the savannah and you you see a pride of lions in the wild. Now, those are beautiful and majestic and very dangerous creatures. There is a right distance by which we should look at them. We would be a fool to think that we could walk in right among them and not wind up as lunch. So follow me here. In nature and with God too, there is a safe distance that we should keep to keep us safe. Now the distance we should keep though is not our closeness to God. That isn't the issue. It's the role of God. It's too often we step over that line. We step too close to that fire or that dangerous thing, not knowing that we're in harm's way when we play the role of God, when we define our own morality, when we sin outright, not caring about the consequences, we play God. And this fear, this fear of God playing that role and taking whatever idol or ourselves and putting it in God's place is completely dangerous for us. It causes danger for us and hurt and for generations to come. This is a fear we need to cultivate And remember what I said, that fear keeps us safe in a broken and dangerous world, but fear also helps us understand our relationship, not not just our relationship, but our role with God, because we're welcome as God's children. We, in Hebrews, it says that we should approach him with confidence. He's our father, he's a good father, and as children, we are welcome. But the moment we step out of children and into the role of God, we, it's dangerous for us and it's God's rightful place. This is the fear we have to cultivate. This is the fear that we need to ask God, hey, help me fear you correctly. Where am I sinning? Where am I stepping into your your role? When am I not being a child? And when am I trying to be God? This fear will keep us safe in the days ahead. Now, I I do wanna come back though, and I wanna talk about one principle of fear that all of us share and none of us can walk through. And that is the fear of the end, the fear of what happens after we die. And we don't talk about it much. It's a bit morbid and strange and even manipulative if we we try to say this the wrong way. So I'll try to say this the right way as I can. We're all afraid of what happens after we die. But I would say that Jesus would tell you, you don't need to carry that fear. That's not yours to carry. When God created us, he intended us to love and keep on loving with ever, without ever it stopping. He didn't ever intend us to experience death, but we brought it onto ourselves. So we fear it, separation, alone. What happens after we die? You don't have to carry that fear. That isn't you for you. Jesus came on the cross so he can take that fear away from us. That he can not only give us life in the hereafter and eternal, but he can actually give life to us now. 
And you'd be surprised that once you're not afraid of what happens at the end, how much it changes the day you're in today. So I would say that if that is a fear of yours, and if you carry that and it keeps you awake at night, then give that to Jesus. Come to him, talk to him, acknowledge that he's, that he's right there because he is. And if you've, if you've never walked through that, it's really simple. You just talk to him. You say, Jesus, I, I want to know you. I don't know if you even exist, but I'm reaching out this, this moment and I don't wanna be afraid anymore. Romans says that if we confess this, that we say that he is Lord and we invite him into our life and we believe this in our heart, then we are in his family. Now, it doesn't stop there. It actually begins there. And the journey from that point on can go in a lot of different directions. The kingdom of God is a very big thing. But we as a church, we exist so that people like you that make that decision don't have to walk it alone. We go together as God's people. So because you guys are watching online and if you were here, we just ask you to come and talk to us. We can't, well, not yet, maybe one day soon. But if you can, if you wanna make that decision, if you, if you have made that decision, text I believe it, all one word, to 97000. This is the best way that we can connect with you. Uh, we can give you all of the information you might need, get you connected to a group or resources that you're curious about. But the idea is to help you on that next step, whatever that next step may be. Now, returning to my, that, that most important fear that we need to cultivate, I'm gonna leave you with this and you don't necessarily have to comment on it but this is something that I would like you to think about for the days ahead, is that the fear of God is something that we have, is broken within us. We don't know when we're gonna cross that line. So be worthwhile to take a few minutes and examine your own heart. So here's my final question for, for you today. What are the ideas or the idols that try to take God's place in your life? And what could you do to put God back in his rightful place? I love you guys and thank you for tuning in and I hope to see you again soon.
crying out for more in your presence we come alive come on open up the doors we are ready we are ready say we're crying out for more in your presence Hey guys, we just want to thank you for gathering with us today online. Hope you enjoyed our worship. I know Pastor Woody's message was a message that we all needed to hear as we walk through fear in life and in fear that just comes our way. You know, today, as you listen to the message, I know some of you took a step of faith to believe. And if that was you, then I just want to challenge you uh, to, uh, to take another step. And here's your step, is that you would text the word, I believe it, I believe it, all one word, to 97000. If you'll text, I believe it to 97000, then we want to help you in your walk of faith as you take steps of belief. So if you'll connect with us, uh, we would love to help you in your walk of faith. You know, at Stonewater, we love to connect with people. On our website, stonewaterchurch.com, you can go and see all the different ministries that we offer as a church. You can also click a button that says, I want to connect. And when you click that button, you're and fill out the information. That information comes to a ministry team and then we uh, do everything we can to help you connect to the church and help you connect to the Lord. You know at Stonewater we have a lot of different things, ministries that are going on, outreaches that are going on and I want to let you know of one thing that's going to be happening this week. Uh, This week starting tomorrow night, tomorrow evening at seven o'clock, Uh, we're having Stonewater Revival Nights. It's gonna be every night of this week, starting Monday, going through Friday. Uh, Stonewater Revival Nights is all about God speaking life into us as a church. Uh, We're gonna be able to hear from a different campus pastor every night, a campus worship team every night. And the goal is just that, that we would sit in the presence of God and be challenged in our personal relationship with the Lord. We're calling it Stonewater Revival Nights. I encourage you to tune in tomorrow night, seven o'clock. You know, one question I've been getting a lot as a pastor of of Stonewater is just, when are we gonna regather? When are we gonna take steps to to, to meet together as a church? And I've been meeting with our staff, I've been meeting with pastors uh, in our church, I've been meeting with pastors even in our communities, and we've been uh, talking about what are our next steps? And and one of the things that that we came back to was this, is that we need to to move slowly, that, that we wanna be protective and not dismissive. Uh, but that, that, that it is time to start taking steps to, to regather. We also said this, is that uh, as we take steps to regather, that, that it's going to be uh, wise to move in phases. Uh, so church, I just want to uh, encourage you right now uh, to, that, that we as a church would move into phase one. You're probably asking, what is phase one? Well, phase one is groups, that, that we as a church would start meeting in groups again, that we would give permission, us as leaders give permission, uh, not pressure, but permission to start meeting in groups. Matter of fact, one idea may be this, you know, next Sunday is Mother's Day. I'm excited about Mother's Day. My wife, Misty, and I are actually gonna be sharing the message together. And with Mother's Day, we, we wanna encourage you to maybe pick a family that you could watch the Mother's Day message and service with. Uh, it could be a neighbor, it could be somebody in your community group, heck, it may be your mother and your father. Uh, but but you would pick out somebody and say, hey, 
let's let our first step to regather uh, be to, to gather in, in homes and to have a home, let's just call it a home watch party where we would watch the services together. But let, let's let that be a first step that we would move towards groups. And, and I just ask as your pastor that you would pray for me and the leadership team as, as we continue to make plans and continue to pray through uh, phase two and phase three as we move uh, towards the future of regathering as a church. Church family, I love you. Thank you again for joining us today. And I, I, I just ask that the Lord continues to bless you this week.